All right. Well, uh, beyond the... Uh, while the storm is still going, uh, plenty of lightning and thunder and some rain still coming down, uh, boy, that flash flood warning was true. A little bit truer than uh, what I had hoped, but... Uh, uh, we will continue. Uh, the last part of our workshop, I wanted to go over the clans. Now, there are more than what is presented in the base book. Uh, but so too with any other RPG, you'll find that uh, there's a good amount of content in the core book, and there are uh, specialties or other considerations in supplemental books. Um, in the prior segment, uh, I equated a D&D character to sitting upon a stool with three legs, uh, in order to be stable, right? So you have race, class, and background. Your core concept in Vampire would be like your, your background. Who were you as a human? And even where do you want to go as a vampire? Your, uh, your race would be like your your clans here. These are properties that you inherit when you become the undead, when you are embraced, uh, and uh, you have been uh, you've been given the kiss. You've been drained of blood, and some of your in uh, in after being drained, some of your sire's blood has been put into you to take hold, and that's. That's how babies are made, okay? Vampire babies. Um, so it's not just off of a bite. It, there's a lot of, you know, interesting concepts. You know, well, if you're just bitten, you'll turn. Or you have to be bitten three times to turn. Or it's a virus or something else. In this case, it's a blood curse passed down by being exsanguinated and then having that blood replaced by the blood of your sire. Um... Oh, you go with the Banu Hakim rip artist. Okay. Um, so in, in this case, you you can come to adopt a particular culture or uh, traits for being reborn into a clan. Uh, just as you would adopt certain traits by being born as an orc. Or an elf, or whatever else, as a human. <laughs> More weather alerts. Sorry about that. According to kindred mythology, Cain sired three childer, who in turn sired childer themselves. This third generation came into being before the Great Flood, and some would say uh, it was their sins that called it down. The survivors, known as the Antediluvians, before the Flood, Antediluvians, became the progenitors of the modern clans. Each Antediluvian's blood endures in their descendants, feeding the common powers, weaknesses, and perhaps even the behaviors and beliefs of the kindred who belong to the clan they begat. Tonight, there are three, 13 distinct clans, along with innumerable minor bloodlines, as well as the Cadef and Thinbloods, who prouder and more powerful lineages reject. Two of the thirteen, Lasambra and Zemisi, have fallen under the shadow of the Sabbat. Two, Giovanni and Ravnos, have been driven nearly extinct outside their ancestral strongholds by enemies mortal and sorceress. Another two, Banu Hakim and the Setite Ministry, in older editions they were the followers of Set, Hi, cat. Yeah, meow. I agree. Uh-huh. All right, well, you can say hi, but please don't destroy my chair. Uh-huh. Okay. As long as we have that settled. Another two remain in limbo between the Gehenna War Zone and the dubious protection of the Camarilla. The final seven continue to maneuver for position and duel for power in the Endless Night of the Jihad.
So we begin our exploration. Who are these clans? We have the learned clan, rabble, punks, hipsters, Prometheans, rebels, philosopher kings, Helens. The Bruja. The dream of the learned clan is a world where all injustice has been eliminated and the living and the undead can coexist in peace. Off the keyboard. Off the keyboard. Come on, please. Please. In truth, they may simply rage against a distant or non-existent god they can never fight, against a curse they can never end. Theirs is a dream that poisons everything it touches. As they infiltrate or instigate revolutions, their hunger and passion ensures that blood will flow, innocence die, and peace never be attained. Hi, Night Mage. Welcome. Uh, Galgrin, hello. Welcome uh, to the Hero Zone as well. Uh, and yes, this is the fifth edition of Vampire the Masquerade we're exploring, Night Mage. And if you have questions between fifth edition and an older edition that you've played, I will do my best to try and bridge the gap or to answer things for you. Uh, now, you can read this in your own copy of the book. Uh, I would encourage you to get it. If nothing else, there's so much fun lore and things to consider uh, that if you want to work it into a different system, sure. Uh, but just, I would urge you all, please play Vampire. Run Vampire. You're going to have an amazing time with it. Uh, so, who are the Bruja? Uh... Again, not word for word, but um, um, uh, Bruja archetypes. Cancer in the system. This kindred existed as a cog in a corrupt system. They may be a night worker for a mortal corporation known for treating its employees like dirt, a staffer in a broken political party, or one of the remaining Bruja in the Camarilla. They work to bring the system down from within, maybe hoping to replace it with something better, but often having the process of rebuilding as the last of their priorities. There are different types that you can play. Now, do you always have to be an anarchist or uh, as a rabble rouser? No, uh, not at all. Uh, if you, Especially if you do not wish uh, to be a, uh, well, yeah, so Bruja is, uh, witch. Um, if you don't wish to, uh, to have any sort of real world connotation, um, then... Oh, what, uh, what's going on, Night Mage? Is there something that I need to adjust on my end? Uh, but yeah, uh, do you have to play into an archetype? No, because ultimately your character is your own. Um, if you just want a, a, a big thuggish bruiser, there you go. You don't even have to be a rabble rouser. Uh, do you want the trolling punk? Uh, then maybe you are the trolling punk. Uh, if you want to be a, some sort of a, uh, as a, a voice of the people, whoever the people are, sure. If you want to try and embrace who the, uh, who the Bruja were, they were once a high clan. Uh, superior to most and respected by all. Some Bruja still believe their blood is stronger than that of other clans and that they have the right to apply their doctrine on others. Um, and in this case... Is the internet wonky? 
Oh, wait, is it on my end? Am I, am I dropping uh, frames or something again? No, you do not have to lock. Your character is your own. It's up. It's up to you. It's up to you to determine uh, how it is you wish to how you wish to grow your vampire. Uh, this would be the, the the archetypes are a way for you to have a broad consideration of a style of play. But you don't... When you make your character and you say, Alright, I'm playing a Bruja. Blood Worshipper isn't like a subclass. It doesn't necessarily give you extra powers or skills. It's a concept... It's a general direction. Like saying, I'm going to walk north. Does that make you a Northman? No. You're walking north. That is just the way that you're going. Uh, do you have to uh, do you have to play as this monster in disguise? Maybe that's the one that interests you, or you accept uh, you know you accept uh, the premise of this concept, but you exclude something or change a couple words. Yeah, they don't always need to be that way. The, and this is a nature versus nurture argument uh, to have, to, to have fun exploring. You, in your life, might have been very peaceable, calm. You meditated every day. And when you were embraced into Clan, uh, into, uh, clan Bruja, that struggle for peace within yourself, let alone some broader societal notion of wherever you live. And you leave all the real world stuff out of it. That might become what is defining you. Because that is a part of the curse that empowers you, but it is this part of you now. That might have uh, ramped up or amplified something that was always there or instilled it in you, and now you didn't have a life to be able to think about it and process it and so now it's it's taking root and taking over there are many different ways you can go about approaching it oh well, i'm not dropping frames night mage you might need to lower the the quality yeah and in this case, for the monster in disguise, if this says, uh, the Bruja claim there is no clan closer bonded to humanity than their own, which is why they exhibit such fiery passions. Uh, vampires and feeling feelings don't always match up. But some take it further than that and strive to live like mortals by keeping up to date with modern culture, forming relationships, and building families. The payoff for this behavior is a startling duality of dream and reality. The beast will not be denied for long, and undead family uh, men and working women must slip away from their fake lives, uh, that should be every, uh, every so often, to avoid seeing red, returning only after they have satiated their dangerous urges. Now, maybe in your world of darkness, all Bruja are unquestionably monsters in disguises, or philosopher kings. Or they're all rabble-rousing and, and causing protests and whatever else. Or you just allow for whatever. But these, these are ways to approach an idea for the Bruja that play into what makes them as such. Uh, while there are histories of the clans, while there are traditions among the separate clans, uh, how they came about, there's also some core aspects of their blood. That is manifested directly in their disciplines. So, congratulations, you're a Bruja, what do you get? Well, you have access to Celerity. Bruja use Celerity to strike fast and escape uprisings they have started. They hunt with it to snatch vessels from the streets, feeding from them savagely, or to rapidly dispose of a mortal foe before vanishing into the night. Can you use it in other ways? Absolutely. 
but this is a uh, a loaded description of how you might find many Bruja using celerity. Potence. Bruja use potence as a devastating weapon, cutting short any confrontation with destructive finality. Though the clan preaches a connection to humanity, its members often take what they want by force, as it is simpler to hold a kind in place or crack their skull open and drink its insides than to negotiate for a mouthful of blood. And presence. Bruja use presence to win the hearts of the crowd, turn a threatening mob against itself, or send a dangerous opponent fleeing into the night. Bruja intellectuals prefer feeding with presence to convince vessels to give up their blood voluntarily. Other clan members use presence to terrify their prey, as it apparently adds an exquisite bold taste and fuels the less subtle powers of their curse. Now they're Bane. You get cool stuff at what cost? The blood of the Bruja simmers with barely contained rage, exploding at the slightest provocation. Subtract dice equal to the Bane severity of the Bruja from any roll to resist Fury Frenzy. This cannot take the pool below one die. And what, what does that mean? Like, what do we see and or what does that mean for your character? What is something that not only do you get, but is taken from you? If you are needing to test to go into a fury frenzy, something has emotionally gotten you worked up, you are less likely to resist going into frenzy for your beast to start taking over and things happening that maybe you didn't intend to happen. You are strong, you are fast and passionate. You have you have those emotions. In uh, D and D sense, this would be kind of like a charismatic barbarian. But in this case, it's easier for you to frenzy, and when you frenzy, masquerade breaches might happen, or you might uh, you might be doing incredible things in a frenzy or terrible things, whether or not they violate the masquerade. Um, well, there's a fiery blood within you. Ah, the Gangrel. I believe Woden. Uh, I believe Woden uh, said that he got the Gangrel. A clan of the beast. Animals, ferals, savages, barbarians, outcasts, wolves, and strays. A hunger older than mankind burns inside the wolves. When other kindred curse their appetites and choose the gilded cage of the city and the leash of social hierarchy... The wolves accept the beast as part of themselves and run free. Crossing borders between species, nations, and domains with the ease of perfect predators. They belong to the wild, and the wild belongs to them. To think of them as noble savages is perilous, as the animals have little respect for the arrogance of civilization, and only the strongest survive their bloody hunts and savage initiations. Trading stories of war and the secret histories of their kind around campfires lit with the bones of their oppressors, they have turned their backs on the Camarilla and fight tooth and claw to escape the endless plots of their fellow kindred. Can you have a, a Camarilla-affiliated gangrel? Absolutely. Are they all Anarch? No. Could you be a, a gangrel and work in the Sabbat? Yeah, why not? Talk to your storyteller for any of those, but uh, it it's written here that they are mostly, you know, they're the free spirited. They travel, they're wild and free. Uh, but if you wish to have them affiliated with a, a particular sect, then go right ahead. Who are the Gangrel? Clan Gangrel are outcasts, wanderers, rogues, and hunters. 
They make havens in the poorest parts of the city and feel no shame for doing so. They claim few domains as their own, but defer to no prince. If a feral enters a city, the prince will either accept it or have to fight the feral to get them to back down. Gangrel embrace from the ranks of survivors and fighters, leaders of prison crews and gangs, explorers, urban and otherwise, and any kind who sees the world as something to traverse instead of something to hide from. They care not for looks or title, but for accomplishment and reputation. A child may be a challenge, but the clan follows rituals and initiations to ensure the fledgling is worth the time. Success means a new honored member of the clan. Failure means simply a forgettable reject or a pile of ash. Hi, Hunter. Good to see you. Any mortal capable of projecting their will onto others, leading a group from disaster to success, or fighting impossible odds, draws the clan's attention. This fact results in a symptom known as too many chiefs. When the clan consists of more leaders than followers, customs encourage fights for dominance, but these rarely last until final death, as Gangrel elders advocate against taking competition for authority personally, instead encouraging a culture of healthy rivalry. Uh, this would be like the clans in Battletech. This might be like druids in a D&D &D world. Uh, while you are more akin to live uh, in the woods as a loner, uh, are you a natural creature? No, you're still a vampire. Would a werewolf still want to savage you as a vampire? Yeah. They might actually stop and think about it for two seconds. Maybe. But uh, you are still a vampire. But you are more of the wild type. Again, there are arch uh, there are archetypes here that you can play into. If you like them, play into them. You are you are not obligated to say I am playing Gangrel (parentheses uncaged jailbird) or Gangrel director of the board. And you might go, oh wait a minute, the a director of the board? How are we talking about people who live, uh, you know, they have friends in low places? Or they live out, uh, you know, they live in a, a cabin in the woods kind of a thing. A director of the board, that sounds like a, maybe more of a venture thing. Or, you know, like, what? This gangrel believes in power wielded not merely with physical blows, but through social presence, authority over others, and command of a group of people such as a club or a corporation. The boardroom gangrel is an alpha who thrives on causing fear and respect who does not play by the rules, and who is capable of commanding others to perform the most unethical actions with threats of personal and professional losses. They stalk their prey through the office corridors at night and in five-star hotels paid by the company card. Okay, well, maybe that kind of juxtaposition you really like. I I would love being this wild gangrel, but also the, the director of a, a company, right? <clears throat> the gangrel relish their animal features and feral natures, and many behave as wild beasts do, leading unlives dominated by immediate physical drives and desires. The unrepentant beast behaved like an animal already before the embrace. Perhaps they were a predatory criminal or an individual who used legal means to let out their dangerous desires. As a vampire, they are a little better. What are the disciplines? What are the goodies you get as a gangrel? Animalism. Well, I mean, considering who we're talking about. A gangrel can use animalism to take on an animal companion, sometimes called a familius. The animal companion can be used for hunting, spying, and attacking. Some gangrel will turn pets on their owners, hound vagrants with packs of dogs or lure strays to them for a quick feeding. You know, that... Come here, boy. Come here. Yay, yay, yay! But you need the blood. Fortitude. As longtime bodyguards and soldiers for the other clans, the Gangrel have benefited hugely from fortitude. The discipline can give them a sense of fearlessness as it allows them to hunt across harsh terrain 
and take bullets and knife blades without worry. The gangrel who emphasize growth and fortitude likely expects a lot of harm to come their way. Protean, ooh. Protean? Gangrel are known for their mastery of Protean as few other clans possess its gifts. Straddling the line between vampirism and shape-shifting, the discipline allows a gangrel to take on the physical properties of another creature or, in other ways, change their physical shape. Gangrel who feed as animals often consider this the truest or at least the best of kills. Kind of why I said druid. Uh, you can grow your claws. You can become more savage. Uh, you actually might take on animalistic features or forms as a vampire through Protean. Uh, Nightmage says I have an atypical Bruja in a campaign myself currently. While she still is quite good at punching things, she also has four charisma and has finance, academics, and corporate etiquette. Yeah! It, and, and, and therein lies an interesting story and further proof that, yes, there are mechanics, there are these uh, archetypes you can play into, but does your character at your table need to fit that? No, not at all. Not at all. What is their bane? Oh no, what, what happens to the Gangrel? Gangrel relate to their beast much as other kindred relate, relate to the Gangrel. Suspicious partnership. In Frenzy, Gangrel gain one or more animal features, a physical trait, a smell, or a behavioral tick. These features last for one more night afterward, lingering like a hangover following debauchery. Each feature reduces one attribute by one point. The storyteller may decide that a forked tongue or bear-like musk reduces charisma, while bat-like ears reduce resolve. All those distracting sounds. If nothing immediately occurs to you, the feature reduces intelligence or manipulation. The number of features a gangrel manifests equals their bane severity. If your character rides the wave of their frenzy, you can choose only one feature to manifest, thus taking one penalty to their attributes. Whereas before, the Bruja would, uh, sub uh, they would uh, succumb to frenzy more easily to, you know, Hulk smash, to go out of control. You risk masquerade breaches or other things. For the Gangrel, when you, uh, when you frenzy, you do become more animalistic, and it's noticeable. You might actually become a walking masquerade breach. Uh, for that night and the night afterwards, as your body physically changes in some way. And so you gotta be careful, and this is this is what happens. You get the cool stuff, but with great power comes that great responsibility. Now, who are the Malkavian? By the way, there is not a Bruja nor a Malkavian... Uh, in the Red Deemer. Uh, I'm sorry, a Bruja or a uh, uh, Gangrel. We do have a Malkavian played by Ravenstar. Clan of the Moon, the Lunatics, Madmen, Jesters, Oracles, Dervishes, Visionaries, the Children of Malkov. Psychologists would diagnose the Children of Malkov with schizophrenia, depression, obsessive compulsive disorder, or post traumatic stress disorder sometimes all at once. In reality, they have all these things and none. Like the wise madmen of poetry, uh, their derangement stems from seeing too much of the world at once, from understanding too deeply and feeling emotions that are too strong to bear. They self-medicate with blood, but that is just a temporary solution. Who are the Malkavians? It has long been the misconception that few kindred families are as disparate as the Clan of the Moon. Other clans see them and reason, quote, they are each mad, so why should their respective origins matter, unquote. To the Malkavians, origins matter a great deal. Though sires may pick childer from all walks of life, age groups, ethnicities, and genders, Every mortal selected for the embrace possesses something only visible to a Malkavian. 
One of the gifts the Malkavians look for in mortals is what they call second sight. If a person interprets dreams, can perceive spirits, or unerringly predicts future events, the Malkavians take notice. Such a person acts as a beacon, calling out to every member of the clan that sees them. Another gift revered by the Malkavians is that of insight. A high level of empathy, finely tuned knowledge of complex subject matter, or just an obsessive drive to pursue the answers to philosophical questions each appeal to the clan. As insight is often tied to profession, the clan benefits from a range of academics and doctors, especially therapists and psychologists. Finally, the Clan of the Moon are fascinated by the broken, individuals uh, who have been changed by traumatic experiences, or who were simply born slightly detached from themselves and the rest of society. To the Malkavians, they are but one gentle push away from having access to an altogether different plane of reality. Rather than treating them as burdens, the clan sees them as having great potential. All Malkavians suffer mental illness following the embrace, sometimes accentuating an existing condition, other times adding a new dimension to their instability. As if their thoughts and actions were based on otherworldly logic, there seems to be no knowing when their condition will manifest destructively or when it will offer important perspectives where uh, such were previously lacking. As a rule, no other kindred feels completely comfortable around a known Malkavian, often viewing them as unpredictable maniacs whose flashes of insight are rarely worth the fits of insanity. Some Malkavians claim there is a common factor to their madness, that they're all psychically linked through a communal wavelength, a shared consciousness of sorts. Those who are aware of its existence refer to it as the cobweb, or, more recently, the Madness Network. Malkavian is my favorite clan, says Nightmage, followed by the Setites, I believe. Uh, no, they still exist. Uh, they're not called uh, the Followers of Set. Uh, they're called the Ministry, or the Setite Ministry. Uh, per usual, there are some recommended archetypes, an influencing presence, a medium. A bad analyst. A fanatic. So in this case, you... Uh, playing... Play a Malkavian does offer a lot of interesting concepts, right? If you can see the beyond, if you're the, the type of person, oh, you're the you're the, the tinfoil hat conspiracy theorist, or you're just the one who can see beyond the veil. Uh, of the clans, and while there, of course, there are certainly ways that you could play up that in a real world setting uh, would be... In a broad real world setting outside of, you know, whatever friends or family you play with, like at your table. Um, I would offer with the Malkavians uh, to use to use this concept in an interesting fashion, even if you yourself might suffer from depression. You know, uh, some like or some other clinical diagnosis or whatever else. This might be an interesting way for you to use that and to explore it, or to use that uh, to a uh, I I can do these amazing things with it or through it. Um, be careful of uh, of running the type of Malkavian. That is that, lol, lol, I'm so wacky and random, call me the Penguin of Doom, holds up a spork, uh, you know, and sings the troll lol 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 song. You can play a, a jester-style character, a random character. Uh, and, and this was something I, I meant to bring up uh, with the character creation before, and even, I guess, with the archetypes. Playing a jester is fine, and you can explore all kinds of 
uh, all kinds of things that either you yourself have or that you know someone who has it. Um, a good character can make a joke. A joke doesn't make a good character. If you're going to play a jester style, a vizier, a bard, or something along those lines, and this, maybe it's exemplified through the concept of the Malkavians, though it, this extends to any character in any system. Remember that a character can make a good joke. But, a joke does not make a good character. It becomes something that is disposable, a throwaway item after the punchline is delivered. Yep, well, it, depending on the connection to the, uh, to the Elders or the Antediluvians, uh, that may or may not still exist, that they are actually all part of the Psychic Friends Network. Um... And, and so there's a lot of fun to explore, because that might very well be the case. Uh, Malkov, you know, Malkov himself might actually be trying to coordinate everything through the Malkavians. And as such, that's why the behavior is erratic, because someone's trying to do something, but they're getting a remote control to think or do something else for a little bit, as everything is being set up and put into place. So what do you get? What are your goodies for playing a Malkavian? Auspex. Malkavians use Auspex to enhance their senses, strengthening their sight or hearing to a supernatural level, or to determine a mortal's fears, illusions, and mental weaknesses, so they can play on them uh, horribly as they prepare to feed. Many a Malkavian has persuaded a vessel to tell them about it, before draining their weeping victim not ten minutes later. Dominate. Some Malkavians use Dominate to lift all distractions from a victim's mind, completely enthralling them. Others use the discipline to draw forth or inflict psychoses through the infamous variant known as Dementation. While some do it mainly for the sake of experimentation, getting into a mortal's head and convincing them that they want to give up their blood greatly assists the clan in surviving night to night. Obfuscate the Malkavians do not advertise their use of Obfuscate, conveniently allowing many kindred to forget they even have access to this discipline. What they use it for differs vastly. While some Malkavians might want to observe the court from secluded corners or play tricks on their prince, others secrete themselves in the houses, wards, and care homes of the kind, watching the sleeping faces before discreetly feeding. So you're good at hiding and you're good at... Uh... You're, you're good at sensing even even things that uh, through sense the unseen. Maybe you can actually see ghosts. And despite you being undead, that can still be rather unnerving. And you can compel the minds of mortals and other kindred as well. Great power, great responsibility. And what is your bane? You get the goods. But what can it cost? Afflicted by their lineage, all Malkavians are cursed with at least one type of mental derangement. Depending on their history and the state of their mind at death, they may experience delusions, visions of terrible clarity, or something entirely different. When the Malkavian suffers a bestial failure or a compulsion, their curse comes out to the fore. Suffering a penalty equal to your character's bane severity to one category of dice pools, physical, social, or mental, for the entire scene. This is in addition to any penalties incurred by compulsions. You and the storyteller decide the type of penalty and the exact nature of the character's affliction during the character creation. So in this case, you're really, you, you are distracted. You're so consumed by the voices or yourself or your guilt or premonitions of what's to come that you are, you are afflicted in some way. It distracts you. It is, you're trying to process something a trauma, a possibility, that awkward moment you had 12 years ago and you can't let it go for some reason. Yeah, uh, uh, Galgren, uh, basically, yeah, think of Deadpool as an Alcavian. Sure, he's a crackpot, but he still moves with purpose and direction. 
Horrors, the clan of the hidden, sewer rats, lepers, hives, carnies, scabs, vagrants, orlocks. Ah, uh, the Nosferatu. We have one in our coterie as well. Well, they're not a coterie yet. Maybe if they get through this. For the Nosferatu, the embrace is a journey through abjection. As the blood of the uh, horror gradually deforms the struggling tissues of the human body uh, into grotesque abominations, weeks of pain result in deformities similar to terrible birth defects, cancer growths, crippling injuries, and leper-like sores. Those who endure it find themselves as monstrous echoes of Murnau's silver screen vision. But perhaps pain and humiliation teaches compassion. The Nosferatu, as they jokingly call themselves, are the most humane of the kindred, wearing their curse on the outside rather than the inside. To blend in, some call on the blood to wear the borrowed faces of their victims or disappear from sight, while others rely on prosthetics and heavy makeup. This, is, this good roleplay stuff, I'm not passing it by because it's uninteresting. I want you to read it, think about it, absorb it. The ar the archetypes, information hub, more animal than man, uh, hunter of monsters, the rat. And this has become, or because of what you become as an Osferatu. What can you do? You have animalism. Oh, like the gangrel, right? Well, what's the difference? The Nosferatu uh, treasure the discipline of animalism for its utility in increasing their spy network, gaining familiars, allowing the delivery of messages, and granting the ability to suddenly swarm an opponent with a horde of rats, bugs, or birds. Animalism also assists the Nosferatu, who wishes to feed from animals. It is often easier and arguably more moral to summon a pigeon and drain it than to stalk a mortal and feed from their neck. Obfuscate. The Nosferatu have mixed opinions on Obfuscate, as the discipline enables them to blend in with others, but also masquerades that which defines their clan. Some Nosferatu are proud of their unconcealed monstrosity, while others take every effort to hide it. Regardless of the controversies, Obfuscate is an excellent tool for hunting and feeding, as few other methods allow a sewer rat to interact with the kind. Potence. Nosferatu use potence to rapidly neutralize foes. The Nosferatu understand the merit of hit and run, incapacitating a wessel before feeding and fleeing, or breaking the Anarch Baron's head before vaulting away from their hangout. Many sewer rats hesitate to use potence before the kind, as it's unfiltered might uh, oppose their deceptions. Also, having potence great strength means that you can uh, you can dig in, you can dig tunnels, you can move heavy things. Uh, you can do the things that need to be done out of sight without the need for heavy machinery and loud noises. You like pretty vampires? Maybe one day, though, Night Mage, maybe one day you can challenge yourself to play a Nosferatu. Now, for the strength, the ability to hide uh, and or the ability to talk to, communicate, or even feed from animals, what is the cost? Hideous and vile, all Nosferatu count as having the repulsive flaw and can never increase their rating in the looks merit. In addition, any attempt to disguise themselves as non-deformed incur a penalty to your dice pool equal to your character's bane severity. This includes the Obfuscate Powers, Mask of a Thousand Faces, and Imposter's Guise. Note that most Nosferatu do not breach the masquerade by just being seen. They are perceived by mortals to be grotesque and often terrifying, but not supernaturally so. This, this is a good consideration. Mm, whether or not every ST abides by that? Uh, this helps. But um, maybe it's not always the case. 
Now who do we have? Oh my gosh, the divas. The clan of the rose. Degenerates, artists, harlots. Uh, Aracolites, hedonists, sensates, and perverts. The Toreador. Ah, yes, this is our speedster character in the Red Deemer. Cursed by their unbridled sensuality, the divas are obsessed by aesthetic perfection. A fashion model overdosing on a bad batch of heroin. A YouTube clip of a perfectly executed beheading. The dazed eyes of a child who has seen too much. Or the reflection of the moon in a pool of blood. These are the kinds of things that make a Toreador lose themselves. They say the first diva finally died in front of their looking glass, unable to tear their gaze away from the image of their face, touched by, their, uh, by, by the reflected dawn. But to dismiss the Toreador as wanton perverts or shallow artists is the last mistake a kindred will ever make. Beauty is power and love can make anyone do just about anything. And that is the promise of the Toreador. They can make even the dead feel something raw, something real. Karma says Nosferatu are an off one for me. I like them, but not for myself. Everyone has a favorite thematically, uh, because of uh, thematically, mechanically, or in the lore that's presented. It's just not your thing, and that's perfectly fine, too. Who are the Toreador? Clan Toreador has ever preached selectiveness in its rituals of the embrace. The clan elders stress time and again that the clan requires pioneers among the arts and every kind of avant-garde. The clan is at its strongest when comprised of the freshest thinkers and those who desire experimentation and aesthetic discovery. For this reason, many Toreador emerge from the ranks of accomplished artists, both new and faded. But not all artists need wield a brush. To the Toreador, art encompasses all forms of entertainment and stimulation. The clan courts the greatest actors, singers, writers, dancers, and even sex workers, if the degenerates believe such mortals will offer something new to their clan. Despite the custom of embracing only the best, the Toreador fixation on beauty and innocence has caused many a diva to make a fledgling in haste. Many a moonlit night, new clan members have emerged as shallow hedonists, one-hit wonders, or just a stunning body with nothing else to offer. The greatest mistakes are erased and forgotten. Still, the clan is diverse, its members considering the ensemble as a kaleidoscope of talent and beauty. The archetypes, the l'artiste, the stage manager, patron of the arts. The thespian spy. Read through them. Maybe you'll like them. Maybe you don't. Uh, archetypes can help, but they do not define your character. Maybe your character uh, is a talentless hack who is embraced as a blank canvas by your Toreador sire. Maybe you don't need to be a rock star or something else already having been made in the mortal world. Have fun. Challenge yourself. Think about it. Now, your goodies. Yay! What do we get for being a Toreador? Auspex. Ah, that's the one that lets you perceive more better. Toreador are ever on the hunt for exquisite experiences and use Auspex to identify the most susceptible vessels and those who might, uh, through their feelings and temperament, offer new tastes and sensations to the drinker during the feed. Toreador also frequently use the discipline on other kindred, catering to their desires or antagonizing them with truths they should not know. Celerity. The Toreador claim they are not combatants, but few move as swiftly as the degenerate using celerity to cut an opponent to ribbons before they even have time to draw their weapon. Toreador often use celerity to enhance artistic or performative skills 
Oh, pardon me. In feeding, they use the discipline to take what they need from a vessel and vanish before the mortal realizes the truth of what has occurred. Presence. Aww. In fact, awe is a part of presence. Aww is part of presence. The Toreador master the discipline of presence, often using it in concert with Auspex to manipulate the emotions of kindred and kind. Presence can guarantee an appreciative audience or cause the failure of another artist. Some Toreador will use the discipline to indulge in carnal pleasures with an unnaturally enthusiastic partner or to lure a vessel into their arms and under their fangs. The members of the clan adore willing vessels, even if the willingness is a supernaturally induced facade. Ah, but the price you pay for your art, your clan bane. Toreador exemplify the old saying that art in the blood takes strange forms. They desire beauty so intensely that they suffer in its absence. While your character finds itself in less than beautiful surroundings, Lose the equivalent of their Bane severity in dice from dice pools to use disciplines. The storyteller decides specifically how the beauty or ugliness of the Toreador's environment, including clothing, blood dolls, etc., penalizes them based on the character's aesthetics. That said, even devotees of the Ashkin school never find more streets perfectly beautiful. Uh, never find normal streets perfectly beautiful. This obsession with aesthetics also causes divas to lose themselves in moments of beauty, and a bestial failure often results in a rapt trance, as detailed in the compulsion rules. As a moth to a flame, you leave yourself open. Or by simply being around something that gives you the heebie-jeebies. You are not at your best. You're so distracted by everything that's around you. Oh, we're getting... Have we already gotten strange? Maybe we're getting stranger. Tremere. The wizards. Usurpers, warlocks, hemetics, thaumaturges, transgressors, the broken clan, blood witches. Yeah, yeah, you use Daunt to intimidate. Yep. Well, Game Master's Vault, you might just be a Toreador. <laughs> a hermetic mage in 8th century Romania, Tremere was the leader of a cabal of magic users rightfully feared for their obsession with knowledge and power. Able to prolong his life unnaturally for centuries, his powers... He was a mage. Don't let the propaganda fool you. His powers eventually lessened and his grip on youth became shaky. Unable or unwilling to accept his own mortality, Tremere cast his eyes on the hallowed secret of immortality. In his greed, the mage, see, uh, instigated the most terrifying magical experiments ever conducted, damning himself and his followers to a hell of their own making. Thousands of mortals were murdered and hundreds of kindred vivisected and drained in ritual circles before Tremere and his cultists thought they had found the elixir of life. How surprised they were to have discovered the curse of Cain. Terrified, they died and woke again to an eternity of unlife and hunger, cut off from their craft. In a mockery of their former magical rituals, now only fresh blood allows the Tremere to cast their thaumaturgic spells to twist reality. After the Second Inquisition destroyed the Prime Chantry in Vienna in 2008, the Tremere fell from gray uh, eminences to Personae non grata in many regions. The arrogance of the Pyramid had made the Usurpers few friends, but the need for sorcery has not disappeared. If anything, it grows as the cursed blood shifts in the veins of the kindred. Without the pyramid ordering them into rank and value, the warlock finds themselves competing with their fellow kindred and increasingly with... Ooh, 
with each other for anything that might allow them to regain some of their former power. A clan-wide chase for artifacts and grimoires belonging to their ashen ancestors rival the social intrigues in ugliness and uh, in ugliness and the alliance with the Camarilla is an oft-used weapon between the houses of Clan Tremere. Meanwhile, the term Mercenary Magus is becoming increasingly widespread, as warlocks who were formerly bound by the will of their masters find themselves free to serve for whatever price they choose. Tremere serve in three ways. The warlocks serve the other clans with occult expertise, they serve the Camarilla with blood sorcery, and they serve themselves with their missions to grasp power. Though more Tremere ascend to Praxis these knights than ever before, they still claim fewer thrones worldwide than Clan Nosferatu. In truth, most warlocks acknowledge that becoming the prince is only useful if it helps them expand their knowledge. Tremere see true power as knowing the ways of shaping the world, having access to the right blood and owning the rarest of ancient artifacts. As the Tremere ally with confused coteries seeking them out, hunt for well-protected relics and artifacts, or closely analyze fragments of lore relating to the Canite mythos, all the while mi uh, miserly guarding their secrets from each other, they are all united in their thirst for knowledge. The archetypes. Uh, Nightmage says we have a Tremere in our coterie. Who knows no blood magic? Uh, and who knows no blood magic and works as civilian CSI technician for local police. They too have auspects. Remember that's uh, perceiving. Tremere use auspects to perceive the auras of others, search for evidence of magical essences and important objects left behind, and to communicate with each other across vast distances without fear of being overheard. When needing to feed, auspects assist a Tremere in looking for a pliable vessel. Now, mind you, many of these disciplines are, I mean, it's the discipline across the clans. This is an approach to use the same discipline in a different way. But if you want a Nosferatu that has auspects uh, to search for secrets or communicate that way, sure. Or uh, another clan that has it or doesn't have it, because you can pick up some tricks along the way for reasons we'll, we can get into later. Blood sorcery. Ah, yes. So this is this is one that is unique to them. Master Thaumaturges, the Tremere's expertise in blood magic, makes them a valued if mistrusted pillar of the Camarilla. Using blood sorcery, they can convey devastating attacks on an opponent's mind and body, defend themselves, and ease their feeding. Some warlocks use Thaumaturgy to sap a mortal's blood from their veins without ever having to touch them. You are a, ma you are a very overtly magical vampire. You are a wizard and dominate. The Tremere will do almost anything for the sake of knowledge and influence, and dominate is the discipline that lets them get away with it. Thievery, backstabbing, and the unjust murder of a clan member's ghoul are all made easier by the ability to control a mortal's mind and body. When attempting to feed, a Tremere will show little com uh, compunction against using the discipline to force a mortal into bearing their throat. And the price that you pay? Once the clan was defined by a rigid hierarchy of blood bonds, reaching from the top to the bottom of the pyramid. But after the fall of Vienna, their blood has recoiled and aborted all such connections. Tremere Vitae can no longer blood bond other kindred, though they themselves can be bound by kindred from other clans. A Tremere can still bind mortals and ghouls, though the corrupted Vitae must be drunk an additional number of times, equal to the vampire's bane severity for the bond to form. Some theorize this change is the revenge of the antediluvian devoured by Tremere. Others attribute it to a simple mutation. 
Regardless, the clan studies their vitae intently to discover if the process can be reversed, and indeed determine if they would want to do so. Uh, so this is a mechanic of the game, uh, social and an actual mechanic in the game, uh, about uh, either blood bonding, uh, making servile other vampires, uh, or by uh, creating... Uh, uh, it can bind mortals and make ghouls. A ghoul is a mortal, but you give them uh, your blood. They're still living, and you give them their blood, and uh, it empowers them, and it, it does bond them to you. Um, and uh, a ghoul is, is nice, because they can do things during the day, and um, you don't have to worry as much about them breaking the masquerade, because you've already broken their mind, because they are completely servile to you. Yep, that is a very good point, Night Mage. And and that's why I also brought up before, if you are a caitiff and you say that you have you have blood sorcery, it could be, yeah, maybe you were actually embraced by a Tremere, you just weren't given, you know, the 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 clan handbook. Uh or how did you get this as sort of like a, a generic blooded vampire? in the lottery of disciplines uh, that could manifest through, you know, a mutation or just the blood is the blood. Um, so some things like this would be a harder question to ask or to bake into your character. Is it impossible? No. But it might take an extra consideration instead of just saying, yeah, I'm, I'll give myself stronger muscles with the Vitae. Ah... The Clan of Kings, Blue Bloods, Tyrants, Warlords, Patricians, the Borja, the Cult of Mithras. The Ventru. This is the clan that Dark Wolf plays on Tuesday. In their own eyes. Only the Clan of Kings has the restraint, the wisdom, the control, and the pedigree to lead their kind through the night. Throughout their time as god kings of ancient Babylon and lords and ladies of the Dark Ages, to their contemporary roles as guardians of royal blood, majority shareholders, and campaign fund backers, they have been obsessed with the impulse to rule. They collect their tithes in the form of precious blood, ensuring the growth of their legacy. While many other clans claim positions of influence in politics and business, no one can rival the Ventru in the game of pure power and wealth. But lately, their arrogant projections as divinely chosen rulers, better fit to lead than any other clan, have begun to falter. Time is running out. As they feel their privileges slipping through their fingers, the Ventru tighten their grip and fight fang and claw to remain in control as the masters of their kind. Clan Ventru has long been the leaders of the Camarilla, holding more positions of power than any other clan, and they are loath to give that up. Even after losing their most prominent representative to a Bruja assassination, the Ventru continue to maintain that they are destined to rule all kindred, no matter the sacrifices involved. The Ventru believe in the strength of tradition and lineage. The embrace is one of their most important rituals, and the choice of child affects the way other members of the clan treat the sire. Ventru therefore aim to embrace overachievers, politically or financially powerful kind, or those with a talent that sets them apart from the masses. These nights, the Ventru are cautious. The talentless fall by the wayside while the best blend in with humanity as bankers, shadow directors, reclusive moguls, and chiefs of staff. No longer can a Ventru openly lead a board or take a prominent position in a mortal community. They resent having to influence their surroundings from the shadows, but know that the risk of a fatal masquerade breach is too high to risk anything else. The Ventru are establishment. They set and maintain the rules, punishing those who break them and occasionally rewarding those who follow. 
Their critics consider them tyrants or the jailers of other kindred. The uncomfortable truth is that without them, the Masquerade and the Camarilla with it would have fallen long ago. The Ventru are more loyal to their cause these nights than ever before, adversity only making them more determined to succeed and more certain that they have the right to do whatever it takes. This might be, uh, in a fantasy setting, the Paladin. Lawful good does not mean lawful nice. Uh, your archetypes, cold-blooded corporate director, member of the order, uh, it, a conservative politician. Uh, you will find that real-world politics written in this book does take a particular slant. Um, adopted or not, snicker or not, but it is what it is written by those who wrote it. A uh, godfather or a high priest. Your goodies. Disciplines. The uh, Dominate. The Ventru consider themselves the masters of this discipline, using it primarily to exert their will on vassals and kind. When feeding, a Ventru may command a mortal to bare their neck or use Dominate to erase all memory of a feeding. Ventru also expertly use this discipline to protect the Masquerade. Fortitude. Fortitude enables the Ventru to keep their thrones even when armies array against them, and to weather every blade, bullet, and bomb. They use the discipline to feed in adverse situations, physical or otherwise. Where other kindred might run short on Vitae, the Ventru resist the environment and take their fill. Hey, there you go, DQ. I know you're having a bit of a losing streak on the uh, on the battles in in chat. Uh, congrats. Presence. The Ventru seek to tame the court and build the love and devotion of others towards their rule, and presence is a helpful tool. The discipline is also used by the Ventru, who wants others to see how easy they acquire vessels. The clan values conservation of time and resources and presence allows a hungry blue blood to be efficient when luring their prey. But there is a price to pay for being in the clan of kings. And what is that price? The Ventru are in possession of rarefied palates. When a Ventru drinks blood from any mortal outside their preference, a profound exertion of will is required or the blood taken surges back up as scarlet vomit. Preferences range greatly from Ventru who can only feed from genuine brunettes, individuals of Swiss descent, or homosexuals, to those who can only feed from soldiers, mortals who suffer from PTSD, or methamphetamine users. It's such that it might even need to be in the blood for the blood to be consumed though the drug may arguably have no effect on the Ventru. Crack-a-boom, if you hear that thunder. Uh, let's see, where was I? Uh, meth users. With a resolve plus awareness test, difficulty four or more, your character can sense if a mortal possesses the blood they require. If you want your character to feed from anything but their preferred victim... You must spend willpower points equal to the character's bane severity. It's tougher to feed. You are very selective. Your ST might not be able to offer something very broad. Um, uh, I mean, if you have a palette for only Swiss people and you're in Switzerland for your chronicle, it might be kind of easy. Maybe your ST allows it. Or maybe... Maybe, in life, you always owned Swiss watches. They were the best. And for you, you live in South Dakota. And when you are embraced, maybe there's a company there that uh, does business uh, with a Swiss bank or something else. Um, is it the, is it the, the Dakotas for what I'm referring? It might be North Dakota. Anyway. Uh, you might have dealings with, uh, you know, big international banks like a Swiss bank or something. And uh, and so in life, 
you had this, uh, you even like Swiss cheese. You put it on everything that you could. Well, now the Swiss cheese is, uh, uh, it comes in a different form. It is warm, maybe not exactly fondue, but unless you have the blood of someone of, uh, of Swiss descent, then you're not going to keep it down unless you have to force yourself to keep it down. And let me tell you, my friends, willpower is a very precious commodity. It can do powerful things and in a pinch help keep you from frenzying or help you get through a very lethal interaction. And if you have to use it and have it only slowly be uh, able to be regained through exertion, it's a dangerous game to play. But that's part of the fun, is the challenge. Now, there are the Caitiff and the Thin Bloods. Uh, it is not that they are unplayable. Uh, it is not that they are broken in any particular way. Um, they are concepts to play that maybe your maybe your ST might not allow, maybe will. The Caitiff characters have access to three disciplines of your choice following the Embrace. Um, and they have their own set of rules. They have their uh, their uh, their own bane as well here, uh, no common bane. So you get uh, you get something else. You are a vampire, but you may not have. You're not diluted in your blood, but you have strayed into a unique strain. Maybe you're the beginning of a new bloodline, a custom blend of sources of things from around you. Um, so this is a bit of a catch-all, a, a custom. In a D&D &D sense, this might be a little bit like a multi-class, being a class unto itself. And the Thin-Blooded as well. There's extra notes, extra considerations, fun archetypes. Um, and uh, there's a lot of extra things that I will leave you to read. Because if you can understand the basic core of the of the like the fixed clans you will have no problem with the caitiff and the thin bloods and i want to encourage you to get this book and to read it to find the power within the caitiff and within the thin bloods and not just have me offer witty commentary on it i know right oh the guy who sells these books is the one encouraging me to buy it. I sincerely hope that you do, because there's a lot to enjoy and a lot to discover in this game and through it, and to customize your own world. Sure, you might play in Cleveland, like my Cleveland game. It could be a completely different Cleveland, because you restrict the clans that play, or you might, uh, you might have a different consideration of uh, all the Bruja are actually Camarilla, and all of the Ventru are actually Anarchs. Why not? That's It's your fantasy world to layer on top of what exists in our real one. So I hope this, this delve gave you some great character ideas. It, it spurred you on saying, you know what? The fact that there's, even, that there's an archetype, not just you know me talking about that, that corporate gangrel. You know, that, that feral, that alpha in the boardroom. I like that. And they do they do get presents. Even animalism to keep track of the the uh you know, the employees. You do have a you have a mole. <laughs> you have a mole among them who can report back. Or Everyone knows you like your steaks blue. Rare is probably well done to you. But being able to eat 
animal blood for as long as you can anyway is a good thing to keep up a rapport with uh, the mortals under you know under whom uh, they they work they work under you yep so well that's part of the the great extent of the flexibility of the caitiff they may not have the built-in family ties uh, that uh, the other members of the clans uh, could. Uh, you have a lot of flexibility and a lot of room to explore. Caitiff, I'm not. Uh, Caitiff are not necessarily difficult to play any more than the others, but it might be something for a more experienced player to dip into after they have some other considerations from. Uh, how games are presented and played otherwise. And the same with Thin Bloods, if either of those two are even an option as a player character, uh, not just as maybe a rare SPC or something. Uh, Nightmage says, One of my favorite things about World of Darkness games is that the creators very much wanted this to be your game. Uh, all of the hard questions of the lore and origins of things are not set in stone, is not handed down to you by the creators, but instead they encourage you as the DM to create your own answers to the Curse of Cain. Yes, 100% this, everyone. Always remember that. Don't get lost in the rules. Don't feel like you have to memorize the lore. This is always going to be your game, your story, that you are playing through or presenting to others that you can you can delve into the personal and political horror that exists as a mockery or a parody of our world or something completely fantastic and different <laughs>